If I want X and you want X as well and there's only one X, who should Allah give it to, you or me? You want the same thing that I do. Who should Allah give it to? We're both praying for it. We've both given lots of sadaqah, done 10 rakats of nawafil prayer, and now asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sitting in i'tikaf in the masjid, who should Allah give it to? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Was salatu was salam wa ala al mabruthi rahmatan lil alameen. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa salam tasliman kathiran ila yomidin amma ba'd. Call Allah ta'ala fil Quran al Majidi wal Furqan al Hamid. Udu rabbakum tadaru an wa khufia. Udu rabbakum tadaru an wa khufia. Uh, dear brothers, dear sisters, dear friends, I had a different topic in mind, but when I came here, I observed something and I, Allah put into my mind to speak about this particular topic, is how do we successfully call on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that our calling on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is accepted and it doesn't lead us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We get constant questions that I've been praying for so long. I've been making dua for so long. And it's not getting accepted. I've done this. I've done gifts, given sadaqah. I've, um, done, I've completed this etiquette. I've completed that particular advice. But still, uh, I can't get married to him. Or uh, if it's uh, a man, I can't get married to her. Or... It's not working out. I've done all of these things. So now, firstly, what I want to explain is that we have to understand the philosophy of dua first. What exactly is dua? So that we don't misunderstand this. If we misunderstand this, we're basically doing the wrong thing and then we get disappointed. Shaitan then uses us, uses that to make us feel bad about Allah. So then we feel despondent that there's no point and Allah doesn't really answer. And people, uh, their faith becomes uh, shaken by this. Firstly, what we have to understand is that we, you, I, every single individual is just a small individual in the grand scheme of things. Allah's creation is in the multitudes. If you compare ourselves in relationship to all the other creation of Allah or just the human beings, we're just a small human being. I know we consider ourselves to be very special. And you know, we individually are all special to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, if I want X and you want X as well and there's only one X, who should Allah give it to, you or me? You want the same thing that I do. Who should Allah give it to? We're both praying for it. We've both given lots of sadaqah, done 10 rakats of nawafil prayer. And now asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sitting in i'tikaf in the masjid, who should Allah give it to? Maybe he should give it to both of us to share, but some things can't be shared. So what are we saying? What, what, how does that work? So if you look at the, the reality of the way matters are, Allah juggles all of this. He doesn't juggle anything. In our understanding, somebody who's so organized, he's juggling multiple things. They say one of the most stressful jobs out there is to be an event organizer. One of the most stressful jobs, I don't know if they've got any event organizers here, you've dabbled in event organizers, very complicated, because you have to worry about multiple things with multiple parties, and then trying to get all that right. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is effortless to literally deal with every single event and incident and individual in the world at every single one time. His knowledge and power extends to every single leaf that falls. And imagine in autumn how many leaves fall off just a single tree. He is talk we're talking about مَا تَسْكُتُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا That's what Allah says. He knows exactly about every single leaf that is falling anywhere in the world at one time, simultaneously in their multitudes. However, now coming back to our perspective, I want something, you want something. So, who gets it? Number two, if I do get that thing, Allah has, remember, He has foreknowledge. He knows about everything. 
If you look at Aqeed al or any of our books of Creed, they talk about Allah knows about everything from before it happens. He knows about something before it happened. And he knows exactly how it's going to be when it does come into being. He knew all of that from beforehand. So, for example, let's just say I do get that particular car or I get to marry that particular individual or I get that particular business or whatever it is. Allah knows that that is going to bring the mischief out in me. It might make me arrogant. It might make me overly confident. It might make me haughty and proud and conceited. I don't know that, do I? Right now, I don't know that. I just want it. I'm so tunnel vision because I'm obsessed by that thing. I want it. But Allah knows in the future. Plus, you have to remember the world we live, live in is a quantum world. What that basically means is that anything that happens in this world has an effect on someone else. I'll give you an example. Has anybody bought a car recently? Please, somebody. Has anybody bought a car recently? Right. So you bought a car recently. Jazakallah for volunteering. Right. I do like to ask questions. Okay. You bought a car. You think, what's anybody else got to do with it? I bought a car. I need a car. Maybe you less compliant. Whatever, whatever the reason was. Basic car. Wonderful car. Put it outside. Or I put it into my garage so nobody sees it. I don't think you can, I mean, unless you're just going to store it there, you put it in the middle of the night, all covered up, and put it in, I mean, people don't do that. You're going to take it in and out. You have 10 neighbors. Imagine what your neighbors all feel about your car. One is going to think, mashallah, he's got a good car. Good for him. He had a banger before. He's got a good car. Another one is going to say, where did he get the money to buy that car from? Number three, the guy's going to say, why did he buy that color or that make or that model? Number four, the guy is going to say, I need a car like that as well. Yes, I'm going to go and get a car like that. It's a really nice car. That's just four people so far. Ten people will have various different reactions and you can't help that. That's just the way the world is, right? You can't help that. Everything we do has some reaction somewhere else. Everything and anything. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever He does for us is usually always in the, it is in the best interest. We just don't understand the best interest right now. Because if I get that thing right now, I might have, God forbid, it might be in an accident the next day. He knows exactly how it's going to affect everything else. We don't know that. We're just selfishly asking for ourselves. So now Allah has a system in place. He says, look, you need to ask me. You need to make dua. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ said, Man lam The one who doesn't ask Allah, Allah gets angry on him. Multiple places in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Fas aluni, like ask me, ask me, ask me. That's a worship. In fact, one hadith of the Prophet is saying that dua is the kernel and essence of worship. Salat is a worship. How does dua compare to salat? Salat, we're offering something to Allah. It's not selfish, is it? Is there any selfishness in salat? Not that we can usually see. Of course, we do it for our own benefit as well. But usually it's an offering. You know, when you make dua to Allah, are we offering Him anything? Or are we being selfishly asking for ourselves? So how does dua, how is dua explained as being the essence of worship and devotion? I couldn't understand. So upon reading and investigation, what it is, is that when you make dua, you're actually devoting yourself to Allah. How? Because you're, we're realizing our inability, our need, our servitude, our helplessness. And we're saying, oh Allah, only you can give me this. That's why it's a worship. We look at it selfishly. Yeah Allah, I'm asking for myself. I want this and I want that. But the reason we're asking Allah and nobody else is because we're seeing Him as our deity, our great one. That's why it's a worship. Dua is a worship. Allah wants us to do dua. Prophet ﷺ said, if you don't do dua, Allah gets angry on you. So then Allah has a system in place. Because He can't just give us everything. People wake up in the, uh, people at night, they make dua for five different things. I want my daughter to be married to this particular individual. I want uh, me to, uh, my uh, business to do this. And I want to open a second store here. Da, 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 da. Yeah, he asks for five different things. 
Out of them, maybe only one happened or nothing happened within two, three weeks. And you're going to say to Allah, you're going to get angry on Allah. Now just think about it, you get angry on Allah, right? Why the answer? Question I'm going to ask you now, right? This should really make us understand. Is Allah your slave or your servant or your employee that he has to do your five things? You come to work and you say, okay, you get this done today, you get this done today, you get that done today, and this one is your job and this is your job. If they don't do it by the end of the day, you're going to be upset, aren't you? Why? You have a right to be. You're paying them. They're your servant. They're not your servant, but your employees. Or if you live in a place where you have servants and you need to do some work, you're going to be upset and you have the right to be upset because you're paying them. Are you paying anything to Allah? So you dictate, uh, you bark a few orders to Allah, right, literally, and then you get angry. Why didn't you give me that? Make any sense, does it? And the reason we think like that is because we don't know Allah and we don't know the system of dua. We just hear, we just understand dua as a, a selfish act of ask Allah. When we're asking Allah, we're literally submitting to him. Now, Allah always gives. Remember that. You're like, he's never given me. He always gives. But he just, because he has to look after everything and what you may be asking for may not be healthy for you to have right now. So what does Allah say? I will respond to you in one of three ways. Just depends on what I know of how to keep everything in. I have to run the whole world. Allah is saying, I'm running the whole universe. Everything has an effect on something else. So I need to make sure everything is right. When I say make sure, I talk in my perspective. Allah doesn't make sure he knows. It, he doesn't make mistakes. Right? But from Allah's perspective, he can only give us what is in the grand plan is going to make sense for everything else. Right? Where does he want it to be? But he says, because you've made dua, I'm going to reward you for that. Just reward, reward, reward. Thawab. But I'm also, every dua you make, I'm going to respond to it in one of three ways as well. Number one, either I'm going to give you what you're asking for because it's healthy for you to have it or good for you to have it, it's beneficial for you to have it, or it's part of the grand plan, I'm going to give it to you. So you get it, right? And you get really excited. Number two, it's not good for you because it's supposed to be for someone else, or it's going to cause this issue to you, or I want to test you in this way because I want you to be this, or I want you to do that. So what I'm going to do is, instead of giving it to you, I'm going to actually relieve you of another calamity that was supposed to come upon you. There were supposed to be some impending calamities and attacks on you. By you making dua, they've just been removed one by one. Number three, whatever you do ask for, I'm going to give you a reward for that in the hereafter. That's for sure. You ask for something, you've asked me, I'm going to give you a reward in the hereafter. Right? When we get to the here, unfortunately, we can't experience this right now, so it's difficult. But when we get to the hereafter and we see the rewards of all of our du'as amassing up, which we never expected to get because we wanted it in the world and we were kind of upset sometimes as well, we're going to think, I wish none of our du'as were accepted and we got it now because that's the real life. But remember, Allah always gives you something back. He's promised that, that's for sure. I'll give you an example. You went for a trip to Bangladesh or Somalia. Right? Or wherever you want to go. Right? I just thought of Bangladesh and Somalia. So, you brought back something really valuable but very delicate. Maybe it's this really art piece. Some, you know, ornament or something. It's very common. Your little one-year-old wants to play with it because it's so shiny and sparkly. He's like, give it to me. Are you going to give it to him? It's very valuable. You bought it for 250 pounds. Are you going to give it to that kid to play with? Because it can easily be broken because it's very delicate. Would you give it to him? Okay, a kid starts crying. Starts bashing at you like, no. You're not going to give it to him. What do you do instead? What do you do instead? If the kid is crying and they want something, you don't want to give him that thing. What do you do instead? You give him an alternative. You give him a sweet or something. All right? Keep him happy. Usually the kid is like, okay, but suddenly they see that again. No, I want that thing. All right? So what you do is you satisfy them some other way. You give them an alternative. This is exactly what Allah is doing. We're kids as well. 
We don't know that whether something is good or bad for us. That kid doesn't know that that thing is not appropriate for him right now. When he grows up, go ahead, bismillah, go on, go on, go and enjoy that thing. But it's not for you right now because you're too young for it. You'll break it up. It's the same way Allah deals with us. We are actually um, like children, basically, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he gives us something else, but we need to keep asking him. So keep asking him. And if it doesn't work out, then just realize, if it doesn't work out, just realize it wasn't for me. That's very, very pacifying and very, very comforting. Okay, I tried my best. It wasn't for me. I won't get it. I'll get something else instead. Otherwise, if you don't feel that way, you're still not going to get it. And you're going to feel upset. So what's the point of that? Understand the way Allah works. The philosophy of dua is very important to understand. So keep asking. Because calamities will be thwarted because of that and repelled because of that. And we'll be rewarded. And inshallah, we'll be definitely rewarded. Or if we're lucky, we'll get the thing in the world. A lot of the time Allah does give us. As long as we're doing the right thing where it's, it's appropriate, we usually get what we ask for anyway. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala connect us to him in a way that we really understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our du'as in the best way possible and make us satisfied.